straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Killer father or innocent man? The shocking possible motive in the murder of a 13-year-old boy. He just was an all well-rounded, good kid, just very sweet child. The Robert Durst trial is back in session with arguments about Durst's health. Will he make it to the witness stand? It had a fight. There was an accident on the stairs. Something terrible had happened. As to the charge of first-degree murder and the perpetration of a felony crime, how does the jury find? Guilty, sir. The verdict for a Tennessee man charged in the death of his five-year-old autistic son. Plus, a settlement five years after a family says police shot their father while selling CDs outside of a store. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law & Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Jury selection is underway in the trial of a Colorado man accused of murdering his son nearly nine years ago. Law & Crime's Angela Levy is here with more on the death of Dylan Redwine. Hey Brian, Redwine went missing over the Thanksgiving holiday in November 2012. It took authorities years to charge his father, Mark Redwine, with his murder. Dylan Redwine was just 13 years old when he disappeared during a court-ordered visit with his father, Mark, in November 2012. A Walmart surveillance camera captured Dylan with his father the evening he arrived. It would be the last time Dylan was seen alive. He was a good kid. He was a great kid. He was an easy kid. He was selfless. He was very caring. He didn't really like to disappoint anyone. Elaine Hall, Dylan Redwine's mom, is eager to see the trial for her ex-husband begin, as are those who oversaw the investigation. Dylan disappeared in 2012. We all lost something. The Redwine family lost an amazing, special young man. And many of us in our community lost our sense of safety, trust, and security in our own homes. The indictment charging Mark Redwine was second-degree murder and child abuse resulting in death claims Dylan's blood was found in several locations in Redwine's home. Then in 2015, the indictment says Dylan's skull was found and showed evidence of blunt force trauma. And the trial is taking place in La Plata County, Colorado. That's about six hours southwest of Denver. Brian? Now, Anjanette, from what I understand, this is not your typical motive for a case. What do prosecutors and Dylan's family believe the motive was? Yeah, we've heard uh, that the motive in this case was the fact that Dylan and his brother may have seen some photographs on their father's phone that showed him dressed in women's clothing and possibly eating feces out of a diaper. And there's actually a question um, about something about that on the juror questionnaire. So it's a pretty startling motive. Um, Dylan, apparently, according to the indictment, had planned to confront his father about something. Right. Truly an interesting case. We'll keep eyes on that as it continues. Thank you very much, Anjanette. Breaking news out of California, where millionaire real estate heir Robert Durst's trial will move forward despite objections from his attorneys. Durst was hospitalized in the jail late last week in the middle of his trial for the murder of Susan Berman. His attorneys say he has a urinary tract and blood infection and can't dress himself, so he is forced to wear jail clothes. Prosecutors say Durst might be faking it and has said on jail calls that he plans to feign dementia to get a mistrial. This is a critical situation, Your Honor. He shouldn't be in court. He should be in a hospital. We're, and, and that hampers us as lawyers from going forward. He's on tape discussing his unhappiness. He filed with the court a letter complaining about the trial, what his lawyers have stipulated to. He doesn't want to be here. He doesn't want this trial to continue. I'm not inclined to adjourn. Let's do what we can. If he has to go home, you know, go back, to, go, go back, he'll go back. We can, I'll supply a, a blanket if you like. I, I, I have a blanket, I can give him a blanket. Yeah, he, he needs to put a jacket over the back of him. You can put the jacket over the back. Terry, there were a number of motions to start this week of the Durst trial. What exactly happened? You know, the defense counsel started out with a motion to get an adjournment of the trial because he's saying that Robert Durst's health is really bad. He said, obviously, that he has a urinary tract infection, that he has sepsis, that he is in a catheter and has a bag 
and that would not be appropriate for the jury to see. He also said that he has an impaired immune system. And so I think all of those things combined, he's on pain medication, he's disoriented. He also said that he doesn't know what month it is. Apparently, Durst thought it was March, when in fact, obviously, it's June. But, you know, Lewin did not want to hear that. He stood up, he argued against an adjournment, and Lewin said that this isn't the first time Durst has tried to seek an adjournment. He said that he was going to use the excuse of COVID and use the excuse of dementia to get an adjournment. So I think Lewin is doing the best he can to argue for his client. But I think, obviously, the judge said, no, you're here today. We will at least continue for the day. And basically, I think they're going to take it day by day after that. Absolutely. On one end, the question is, is he healthy enough to participate in his own defense? But I think, like our very own Linda Kenny Bodden said, that prosecutor John Lewin and the judge will have this case continue. Whether or not you have to bring Durst in a barrel, bring him in a wheelchair, bring him in any kind of way, they're going to go full steam ahead. Terry, thank you very much. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, almost five years after the death of a father, his children reach a multi-million dollar settlement with Baton Rouge officials. But first, the jury is out, the verdict is in. Will it be not guilty or guilty for a Tennessee man accused of killing his five-year-old son? Welcome back. We're headed to Tennessee for the verdict in the Joseph Ray Daniels trial. The man accused of killing his five-year-old autistic son, Joseph Clyde Daniels, who was also known as Baby Joe. The jury may have found the father of three not guilty of first-degree murder, but they didn't let him off the hook for the death of Baby Joe. Daniels was convicted of a lesser-included charge of second-degree murder, as well as first-degree murder and perpetration of a felony, aggravated child abuse, initiating a false report, and tampering with evidence. His second charge, first-degree murder and perpetration of a felony, is the most serious and carries a life sentence. Sentencing of the 31-year-old will be September 14th. Law & Crime host Jesse Weber got a chance to speak with Daniels' defense attorney, Jake Locker, after the verdict. Here is what he had to say. I can't say that we were completely surprised since they did bring in a um, alleged live witness kind of at the last minute. Prior to the trial, we had no information that a brother was going to be testifying. Once the brother testified, uh, it made it clear that the jury could reach a verdict like they did. So I can't say I'm surprised. I'm glad they did not find my client guilty of premeditated murder. Well, I think the jury did the best job uh, they could with what they had. Uh, I do think there were errors committed in the trial. I think some of those areas are reversible areas. We will be filing an appeal to the Court of Criminal Appeals, and uh, it's our hope that we'll receive a new trial. How's your client doing, by the way, after the uh, verdict? He's doing well. Uh, he's anxious to start the appellate process, and I've told him we'll have to go through sentencing. We'll then have to argue a motion for new trial, and then we'll have to file uh, the appeal and he knows that that'll take time and that if he gets a new trial, it would probably be next year at the earliest. Joining us today is civil rights attorney Jeff Storms and Terry Austin. Jeff, does this affect Crystal Daniels' case, the co-defendant who's charged with lesser charges, uh, and should we expect a plea or a trial from her? You know, Brian, I think it puts put significant pressure on her defense attorneys and on her. You know, a jury already has not believed, um, you know, uh, his story. Uh, and she's there, you know, through investigators, she's placed there at the scene. And so I think that, you know, another jury is going to have a hard time believing that she didn't have some understanding that the child was being beaten um, and was in danger and that she ignored that danger. Yeah. It's going to be difficult to point the finger when the other person who you're pointing to was already convicted, for sure. Terry, you've been watching the trial from day one. Are you shocked about the verdict? And do you see any of these uh, appellate issues that the defense is raising could overturn this case and have a new trial? 
You know, Brian, I think the jury got it right. I don't think this was premeditated, but we did get the lesser included murder charge and the felony murder charge, and plus all of the guilty verdicts on all of the other charges. So I think that was the right outcome. I don't see any grounds for appeal. I think Judge David Wolf was one of the best judges I've ever seen at a criminal trial. I think there's absolutely no legal error here. He let in Daniel's confession. That might be one of the areas, and I think that was correctly let in. He also excluded some other testimony. So, for instance, one of the neighbors, it was hearsay, the judge said, the mother of the girl who might have heard something, she said that that was something her daughter said, and the judge said that that was not reliable and that it was hearsay. So I definitely think that the verdict is going to stand. I don't think there are grounds for appeal or new trial. And so I think we're going to just go straight to sentencing, and, and that will be that. Yeah, we'll definitely see the sentencing and see what arguments the defense does raise in terms of an appeal in that case. Thank you. And now to Texas, where officials have charged a Dallas man with capital murder in the death of a four-year-old boy. 18-year-old Darren Brown is accused of kidnapping and killing Castronon last month. Investigators added the capital murder charge after finding the child's blood on Brown's clothing and sunglasses, according to a new report. Brown was already facing kidnapping and theft charges after home surveillance footage showed him taking the boy from his bed. A jogger found the boy's remains the next morning. Jernon's twin brother was sleeping next to him when the four-year-old was kidnapped. Police say the child suffered a violent death from a, quote, edge weapon. Brown is being held on $1.6 million bail. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, one witness to George Floyd's murder has been given a prestigious award. Plus, would you take the stand in your own defense at trial? We speak with Dan Abrams about his new show featuring defendants who did just that. Your sneak peek into Court Camp presents Under Oath next. Welcome back. One of the most compelling moments in any criminal trial is when the defendant takes the stand. Law & Crime founder Dan Abrams is here to tell us about his new show featuring compelling testimony you don't want to miss. It is incredibly rare for criminal defendants to take the stand. Real suspects accused of murder. It's a high-stakes gamble. Very few take. Delivering real testimony in their own defense. You acquire the knife and the zip ties. Never leave home without them. Will they stand the pressure or fold under oath? You put the gun bitches from his head. Looks like extreme planning. It's an accident. An a &E original series, Under Oath. Law and crime viewers should recognize some of the cases uh, that you cover on Under Oath, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, you'll see, look, some cases that people will remember, like the Jody Arias uh, case, for example. But then you're going to see other cases, like, um, you know, two of the cases that I think uh, were the most interesting, uh, both of which were law and crime stories, were the Tammy Moore case and the Lindsay Parton case. Um, both cases of women, Tammy Moore accused of killing her husband's uh, girlfriend, and in the case of Lindsay Parton, a babysitter, accused of killing a three-year-old girl. In both of those cases, one of the reasons I found these to be the most interesting cases was because it was unclear whether they did it. And there was a real question um, about, um, you know, well, wouldn't they not take the stand that Tammy Moore sits up there and tells you everything that she says happened? So those are the cases I, I found to be the most interesting were the ones where it was really close and the defendant's testimony really made you say, hmm, you know, I, I, I wonder, is, is this person guilty or not? But this is really telling you how we got there, as well as the defendant's decision to take the stand. The whole show is all based around this defendant, um, this person who's choosing to take the witness stand. But there's always a story uh, behind it, how the person got there. Um, there's surveillance footage, there are 911 calls, there are videos, et cetera, that all sort of help you piece together what you think happened. And in the end, the viewers can decide, because I can tell you, even behind the scenes, the producers have debated, oh, you know, I didn't think this person did it, or I think that that was a fair verdict or not a fair verdict. And I think that the reason you often see that kind of passion coming from the producers is because they've now all seen the defendant testify. 
they've heard it from his or her own mouth. And it kind of allows you to have, a, I think, an even more passionate opinion about guilt or innocence than if a defendant doesn't take the stand, as is the case in, in most murder trials. Interesting cases and stories in that under oath airs Wednesday at 10 p.m. on A&E. When we come back, a settlement in the police shooting of a father of five. How much a city will pay ahead. Welcome back. The teenage girl who shot the viral video of George Floyd's arrest and death has received a prestigious award. Darnella Frazier was walking to Cut Foods last year with her nine-year-old cousin when they stumbled upon the arrest. Darnella started recording the video with her cell phone and posted it on Facebook. It went viral, sparking protests and outrage around the world. Darnella has been awarded a special Pulitzer Prize citation for, quote, courageously recording the scene and highlighting the crucial role of citizens in journalists' quest for truth and justice. Terry, let's go right off the bat. What are your thoughts on Frazier receiving this special citation? And how did you feel that the Pulitzer Prize board described her actions? Well, you know, I think it was a well-deserved award. She was only 17 at the time. She had her nine-year-old cousin with her. And it was difficult. You know, she sat there and she, in fact, videotaped the whole thing. She posted it on social media. And if you recall, Brian, when she testified during the trial, it was difficult to her. She felt guilt and she felt as though she had not done enough. And I think it's important that she is recognized here because I think it will help with the fact that, you know, she feels so bad about the whole situation. And I think she actually did a lot for everyone here. This case would not have gotten to the point where it did with the conviction. So I'm glad she got it. Congratulations. Well done. Now, Jeff, you and I met in Minneapolis. I know that you are also representing uh, Dante Wright. I want you to talk to us about the importance of citizen journalism and filming these types of incidents for people like Darnell Frazier and how that's changed the criminal justice system. Well, Brian, the highest burden of proof in the criminal justice system is beyond a reasonable doubt. Unofficially, when it comes to holding white law enforcement accountable for excessive uses of force or crimes, particularly against people of color, I think unofficially it's some higher standard that is beyond all certainty or with 100 percent proof. Uh, they, they hold these uh, officers in really such a seam and are afraid to be skeptical of them. And so in order to combat that sort of these natural inherent prejudices that exist, against holding law enforcement accountable for excessive uses of force on people of color. We need people like her. Uh, we need that video evidence because without that video evidence, a lot of times we see people in the United States just turn their brains off. They accept whatever the character assassination is. They accept whatever the law enforcement version of events is. And these citizen journalists have provided uh, the evidence necessary to start holding people like Derek Chauvin accountable and their bravery cannot be commended enough. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And now to Louisiana, where the family of a man shot and killed by police in 2016 has reached a settlement. The city of Baton Rouge will pay Alton Sterling's five children $4.5 million. Police shot Sterling six times in 2016 after receiving a call about a man with a gun selling CDs outside of a convenience store. A lawsuit claimed the 37-year-old's civil rights were violated and cited negligence in the training of Officer Blaine Salamone. He was fired, but later allowed to resign. Another officer involved in the shooting was suspended. The officers were not criminally charged. In addition to the settlement, the Baton Rouge Police Force has promised to make several reforms. Now, Jeff, this is somewhat connected as well. Sterling was killed in 2016, and the case just got settled. Is this a victory for the family, even though the officers were never criminally charged? Well, first, Brian, I'll say on the civil side, it is a tremendous result. There were some hurdles that, uh, that Chris Stewart and his team were going to be facing in that case, and I think they did an excellent job for that family. Criminally, uh, 
you know, there were two investigations, and that's because there was really troubling conduct, but ultimately no charges. And the problem I have with these cases is that prosecutors usually come forward, they look our families in the eye and say, well, you know, I can only really prosecute cases that I believe that we can win. But for any of us who've been involved with the criminal justice system, particularly, again, when it comes to people of color, we've seen prosecutors overcharge time and time again and put it into the hands of the jury. And so when there are these close call situations involving law enforcement, I don't know why the default is always to say, we don't think we, can't, we can win, so we're not going to bring it, as opposed to say, let's give it to a jury and decide these close call questions that we haven't even you know, bothered to prosecute really for decades. Absolutely. Now, Terry, after Sterling's death, city officials rewrote the police department's use of force guidelines, something the family applauded. What's your take on the changes in the city? You know, I think it's important, Brian, not to just have a large settlement, because that's important to the family. Obviously, it doesn't bring anyone back, but it does help with expenses, et cetera. But when you have that in conjunction with changes to policies, changes to practices, then I think it really does make a difference. One of the things they said that this was going to do was to make sure that there's additional training on de-escalation, that there are verbal warnings before using deadly force, and that the officers really are prohibited now from using chokeholds and from firing into moving vehicles. So if those changes are made here, and if we see those types of changes, I think in other jurisdictions, it will be helpful. Changes to their practice and hopefully enforcement, both sides providing a change. Thank you both, and thank you for joining us here at Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.